Hello everyone and welcome to episode 11 uh, of season 2 of the Ice Sphere. I'm I. I'm Joy. And today we are going to be talking about Netflix's new release, Nimona. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the latest Twitter shit fuckery. Um, yeah. And why you shouldn't apologise for the ukulele when you're... <laughs> Uh, making a YouTube video apology. Um, but yeah. anyway, we, we so Namona Joy, you told me to watch this uh, today, and we kind of both both crammed in our readings before we did. But we did. How did you learn about the film? Uh I knew about it um, because I follow um, Eugene. You, I can't say his name now. Eugene Li Yang or oh, from the Try Guys. He's in it. He's a voice actor for it. And cool. I, I knew that was happening. But then as soon as it went live on Netflix, my inbox was nothing but watch Nimona, watch Nimona. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, uh-huh, I can see that some people want me to watch this. Yeah, I will, I will definitely give it a try. And then I started watching it and I immediately went to you and was like, we should probably watch this for an Ice Fear episode at one point. Yeah. And then you say, let's watch it for today's episode. So I'm not watching the whole <laughs> I had, thing. I had no other ideas. I was like, yep, <laughs> fine, we'll do that. Let's go. Um, but yeah, what was your what was your thoughts on it? I think, like, I just want to preface this. It was interesting watching it because I, I, I don't know why, but I put myself in the shoes of a parent, which I'm not. But I was like, was there, was there films that came out when I was young? that my parents were like we definitely need to have our kid watch this because this will teach some sort of valuable lesson because i'd say the movie's very overt with like the themes politically at the moment yeah i honestly thinking back to my childhood no a lot of the films that i grew up with in the you know the early 90s and everything else was kind of the um you know, as long as you're pure of heart, you'll succeed. Yeah. It was always, it was always succeeding within the system. It was, yeah. it was making the system recognize your worth by being virtuous and being persistent and all these things. And the system will eventually come around and, you know, accept you. And yeah. then I've seen, I've seen the shift over years. And this is a very, very blatant, the system does not accept you break the system message, which I am all for. Yeah. Like I am so excited for my niece to be old enough to watch this, so I can be like, and this is why we try to <laughs> fuck itself. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so excited for her to be old enough to understand it. But um, yeah. it's, it was, I it, I can't remember anything like that when I was even a teenager. I mean, there yeah. were probably was, but I wasn't being exposed to it in the UK. Um, or it was always kind of like framed as. I mean, I remember um, the, some of the stuff I would watch as a kid. It was all, it was always, always framed as you will always eventually be accepted by the system as long as you do the right thing. Yeah. And I grew up neurodivergent, didn't know I had several disabilities because I wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult, always knowing that the system did not accept you even though you tried. And to me, watching Nimona was very healing to have people that are going, but if you just try and if you just do your best and you'll get accepted and for them to go through the realisation of, no, actually, you don't. Yeah. That, to me, was very healing to watch as someone who's, you know, like, grew up closeted from being bisexual, you know, didn't know I was neurodivergent, thought I was just weird. You know, all these kind of things that, made me feel like an outsider and I was continually told well if you just try hard enough and if you believe in the goodness of people you'll eventually fit in and Nimona just completely it was like taking my bath and dunking it into some nice clean water and yeah. just pulling it back out and going here you go you actually were not the problem and yeah. so that that's to me is a very important message like I'm so happy that there will be children that grow up with that and go oh I am different you know but that's you know, if someone's picking on me for being different, that's, a, you know, the, it's the fault with the system, not me. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, so I think... Good. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it, it was... I really, we're, we're going to be able to do a deeper dive once we kind of talk through the plot. I suppose for anyone yeah. who's not seen the film, we will be kind of given a, probably a little bit of spoilers. We'll try not to go too in-depth on, like, specific beat-by-beat scenes or anything like yeah. that. But we'll... 
well, we need to give a kind of overview of the plot to kind of like talk about it. Uh, so spoilers for anyone who uh, hasn't seen it yet. Um, I think it's, it's one of those films though that someone could talk about the film to me and I would get it quite quickly though. So and yeah, I'd probably we, was, could, we, could, we could talk about this for hours and we would not give you the full depth of what it is yeah. because it's it, there's so much behind it. There's so many layers to it, and I'm sure there's many that I'm missing in terms of like I don't have the experience of racial discrimination and yeah. that's the same as well I don't have the experience of being um you know there's a, a kind of very non-binary trans undercurrent as well which I can't obviously speak from experience but I can speak a little bit from the point of view of disability with me you know one of the main characters is immediately disabled <laughs> in the first yeah, like, immediately <laughs> immediately disabled um, and um, it's yeah it's a ve- there's things that we will miss because of who we are yeah. And you should absolutely read up on when you look, look at other people's takes. You should absolutely be reading the articles that are coming out about it because you know they give such a good perspective. It's funny um, you mention that because one of the things I did before this podcast, after I had finished watching the film, I decided to look up a bad review of it. Someone had rated it two stars, um, and I was looking through and like there was some there were some points that I sort of agree with, um, but then there was just this. I almost feel like it was a pushback against like animation in general. <laughs> um, yeah. I think there was a there was a couple of things from like the the makers of the film. I think some of them had come from like Pixar and and stuff like that. And they basically said that there's a lot of like the technique that didn't differentiate the film enough. Um, but again, I suppose that's not. I almost didn't care about the, that sort of criticism. It's not. It's just like that'll be someone's personal preference. I'm also not mm-hmm. sure. Is my camera being a tube at the moment? It seems you to be are very, flickering slightly. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but anyway, we'll see how it goes. Uh, hopefully, we don't cut out. <laughs> um, but okay, let's give an overview of the film. I'll let you start, Joy, and I can plug in the gaps if there are any. Although I doubt there yeah. will be. So the premise of Nimona starts with um, Ballister Blackheart, who is... Boldheart. Uh, Boldheart. Is it not Blackheart? It's nah, Black, it's, is it Blackheart it, in the graphic novels? Oh, it might um, be. Ballister Boldheart Ball, in the film. Ballister Boldheart in the film. Um, and he's an outside... All, all these knights are orphans. So it's a very technological, cyberpunky, almost renaissance fair society where you still have these knights and everyone dresses very courtly. And they have these knights who are all orphans who basically become heroes of the realm to fight the monsters beyond the walls that they've, you know, they've they've walled the city in to protect you from these monsters. And you have this main character, Ballister, who is seen as, um, you know, kind of lesser than all the other knights because he is an orphan from a a lowborn family. He is yeah. from poverty. The He's rest of the knights are from like yeah. a noble lineage that all descend yes. from like this main hero Glorith. Yeah. Uh, so that that plays um, a kind of big role in it. Um, yeah. And it is weird, the society itself, while it is very, like, courtly, it's also heavily kind of sci-fi. There's, like, the, the intro to the film is very much, uh, like, people have iPads, and there's, like, Instagram, and, you know, like, all of the knights have, like, showreels. Whilst, whilst you're walking around a fantasy-esque world. It's really interesting. I really do like it as a, as a visual style, because like, you do have yeah. kind of... Um, it almost reminds me a little bit... There was a Russian sci-fi series that I read as a teenager, and I think one of the... They made a video game called Hard to Be a God, and okay. everyone was dressed in, like, Renaissance period clothing, but you you found out that the main character was actually like a time traveler and he had all this like high tech stuff. So he'd be walking around in like his Renaissance gear and he'd have like a an iPad or whatever. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of that kind of the blending of like, you know, the, the sci-fi meets fantasy in a very mm. literal sense. Um, and it, don't hate me for this, it kind of reminds me of Shrek in Shrek 2. Right? The, the kind of, the way they do the nights and the way they yeah. do like, the, fa- the fantasy town and it's very kind of um uh, <laughs> kind of Disney-esque. Like, yeah. Almost like a kind of like, oh look how di- like if a theme if a city was a theme park, that's a really good way to describe yeah. the city. If a city was a theme park and then the lower down you get in towards poverty, 
do have like the people using access tunnels and it's a lot more nitty gritty and dark and grim but the higher up you get you get the kind of fantasy version of everything yeah um and it's, it's, like yeah. there's there's basically a big arena event where the kind of knights to be they've not really given been given their like grand knightly titles yet um but the idea is that the the city is very undecided on ballister boldheart as a uh, being allowed to join the knights in the first place so he's the first mm-hmm. knight from this kind of like lowborn family and the rest are all kind of very very privileged uh kids um including they, his boyfriend yeah including, including his boyfriend uh, ambrosius Golden loin. loin. <laughs> golden loin or whatever. I was like, golden yeah. loin, come on. <laughs> loin. Um, it's actually, interestingly, I love his character. I love what they did with um, him because that's Eugene's character, Eugene yeah. and the Try Guys. And Todd, who's the kind of the broski knight, the kind of like the dumbass one. Yeah. Uh, he, he used to be what Ambrosius was. So they had this major falling out, and it was like, "Oh, my boyfriend's just a jock," and all these things. And they yeah. made it; they did it differently from from what I remember from the graphic novels. So it, it was really interesting the way they split his character to try and have a more in depth narrative. It's really interesting. We'll get into it. But you have the opening with, um, you know, Ballisters kind of questioning whether people will accept him as a lowborn knight, yeah. and you have his boyfriend who is very sweetly going, "Everyone's going to love you because I do." Yeah, and you and, know the he gets the whole talking up from like the director and the queen being like people are going to see who you really are today. Yeah, and like um, the, the queen has made the decision to kind of promote Ballister to a knight from his lowborn. Like it's it's very much been like the queen driving this. It's not the people going. We really want a lowborn because you see like the news at the start. They kind of interviewing people on the street and it's like what do you think of this lowborn becoming a knight and you know they're given very i don't know you could kind of see it being on the news now like sometimes i think the film does teeter a bit close to like being a bit too self-aware sometimes um but it's very it's they're, they're good at the way they do it yeah you're right it is a very kind of like what do you think of ha- you know having the first female prime minister and yeah. you have someone going yeah it's about time and someone going mm, i don't know it's that kind of very you know ask the people what they think and as um a lego two by four in chat is saying he's the diversity hire he is the the, the lowborn being brought up because it's what the kingdom yeah. needs to move forward but everyone's kind of treating it as oh you're just a token yeah. you're not anything and, and all of the other knights bar uh, his boyfriend think that and like basically bully him um and the, he goes to get knighted and his sword that he gets given his sword um uh by, by the, the by director. the yeah by the director and he takes his sword up and hands the queen the sword to do the knighting and the sword shoots a fucking laser beam out and kills the queen in front of absolutely everyone um and the kind of story begins there where he um briefly escapes uh after having his arm cut off by his boyfriend (laughs) yeah and um the he yeah and he he escapes to basically scurry away to a place where he can repair, like, or basically make a robot arm for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, there is an ongoing joke throughout the film that cutting off an arm is not a love language, which I thought was really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, so he's on the run, and that's pretty much it. And Nimona kind of appears out of n- nowhere, Nimona, really. Nimona is walking through the city, and they are shown to be very despondent with the kingdom mm. um they're, they're vandalizing things and people are i don't know if Nimona is she or they i because at one point it's you know Nimona's character is Nimona. <laughs> fluid, flu, flu, fluid in every sense of the way because at what point she'll be like oh can't you be a little girl and she's like i'm not a girl and then there's times when she presents as a boy and it's like i'm a boy for today so Nimona yeah. is very you know very gender fluid, but also just every every aspect of her is fluid because she can change into whatever she wants. Yeah, they're a uh, shapeshifter, so they go, yeah. you know, here, here, there, and everywhere. And there's 
various forms that Namona takes uh, and and uses for mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of a lot of chaos. Uh, Thank you, Pro Lights, for pointing out that she gets referred to as she, her, and it's never correct. It's that that simplifies it than me trying enough. to explain <laughs> Nimona's Nemo, various forms, including a whale, <laughs> a rhinoceros, <laughs> several others. a gorilla, yeah, um, and and yeah. So from from that, obviously, uh, Ballister's a little bit skeptical uh, because when Nimona's introduced, she's really playing up the evil aspect but to be a people psychic i want to yeah. help kill people i want to take down the kingdom and he's like no i just need to prove that i'm innocent and the sister will prevail yeah and she's like no i want to murder people um and the animation for that's quite good uh like she she's extremely hyper and chaotic and she's got this kind of like evil grin that she can you know be quite her innocent self and then the animation will like snap it's like that frame thing mm-hmm. that we talked about with um we were talking about spy family where it's like the comic timing of the change in facial expression yes. can be pretty good um and he kind of backs away and tries to go and solve it within the system and he mm-hmm. immediately gets imprisoned <laughs> uh one of the things i thought was quite interesting and like i, I suppose it's it's something that obviously I've seen kind of like parallels of, but like when he gets imprisoned, they take his arm, which mm-hmm. immediately d- made me think of that "Am I the asshole?" story on Reddit, where <laughs> a, 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 a like a divorced dad comes to pick up his kids on the weekend and finds out that like the mum has punished the daughter by removing her arm. She's got like a prosthetic arm. Mm-hmm. And like the the mum's taking her arm, and he goes absolutely ballistic, and it's like that is like a genuine like thing. It, I suppose it's, from... it's very cruel. It's a very kind of um, it, it. It's very it's telling too because Ballister, you know, when Nimona points out they took your arm, he's like, no, they just they took away a weapon. Yeah, and it's very telling that he sees himself somewhat as. A villainous character in the sense because although he's not responsible it was him that did the thing he was used he was used as a weapon to commit an act of murder and he's kind of regarding himself as that but it's a very kind of um good commentary on a lot of ableism that is in the system where if you are non-compliant a lot of the time your disability aids will be taken from you yeah um and it's like you know, it's silly things like when if I think like if, if people aren't aware, my rings they're not aesthetic. These are mobility aids for me. They hold my fingers in the right position so I can type. Um, I have to take them off at airports because they will set the alarm off, which isn't. It doesn't seem like a huge deal. It's really not. But if I lose them, a single one of these is worth more than my engagement ring and my wedding ring combined. And taking stuff off, you know, it's hard enough taking your shoes off at the airport when you're disabled. When you're being asked to take off something that helps you move, mm. it can be a, a very real problem. Like I, I struggle to like hold and move certain things if I don't have these on. And um, I've also seen like an air, like, again, the airports are a classic example because airports are a disability nightmare. But like you're subjected to more physical violations if you're in a chair and you can't stand, you will be patted down. Um, and you will be patted down more thoroughly because they don't actually believe you're disabled sometimes. They think you're mm. using the chair to hide things. You'll have your you know, your crutches taken away. You'll have your cane taken away. They'll go through everything. And if you are non-compliant, you don't get it back. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a very scary thing. It's, a bit, you know, it's the same as like um, when disabled people get arrested. A lot of the time, you know, disability is not considered. They'll just take away your, they'll take away your crutches. They'll take away like anything that your gives wheelchair. You they'll take away that, literally yeah. anything. Mm-hmm. It's a form of punishment. Yeah, um, and that is that obviously also extends to people's like treatment of it as well. I mean, the amount of times I've heard about someone's like you know wheelchair or mobility getting like mm-hmm. chucked into cargo, and you always see it, it's like they're not giving a fuck. It's getting like weaked in, uh, and it, you know the amount of damage mm-hmm. and stuff that comes from that. My um, brother, so I have a story about that. My brother is in a wheelchair um, all the time. He's a wheelchair user. And we were traveling to America and his wheelchair ended up in France. We were in New York. What? So someone took his chair, put the wrong label on it, and it ended up in a completely different continent <laughs> from where we were heading. Um, and it also got damaged. 
because as people are saying in the notes and as you said yourself they just break them they don't yeah. care um a lot and uh, airplanes actually do have wheelchair you know, for folding chairs at least it's supposed to be used for your folding chair and the mm-hmm. flight staff are using it for their luggage and you often have to fight them to be like no i need my chair yeah. and they're like no 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 that's for staff luggage it's not staff have a designated spot for luggage they just prefer using the more accessible one for themselves yeah um but there's there's actually a lot of changes about that that's something we can talk about in a different episode but, um there's actually british airlines are actually making planes that are accessible so you can just wheel onto the chair and your chair slots in mm. that is amazing i that's want that cool. to become the norm yeah that's uh, interesting but yeah, it's, better than the other was, thing I fucking saw, which was like they tried to do like a double decker seating plan. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you saw that photo. It looked fucked. Um, but no, that sounds really cool. Being able to like actually get your chair in and kind of clip in. Almost. Yeah, it was it was a fully um the you know the chair they they had a limited amount of them because of course they're limited. Yeah. But um, the person was shown like wheeling back in and the chair locks into place. And then ah, they're, cool. made, they're widening the aisles so the chairs can go up and down, which mm. is fantastic because the aisles are barely big enough to, for people, able-bodied people to walk up and down. Yeah. Um, so that was a fantastic thing that I saw. And it really, going back to Nimona, to me, watching them take away his arm, I was like, oh, well, yeah. if he's dangerous, why don't you take all of his limbs? Why are yeah. you taking away the one that he needs because he has, he's been disabled by violence committed by your system? yeah and it's interesting that like they did they did it immediately like he he's he's literally just lost his arm at this point <laughs> and mm-hmm. like the the moment he gets put in a, a prison cell and i think i think he does say oh the guys that's not cool as they walk away with his arm um and it's not long before namona shows up uh holding <laughs> holding said arm holding his arm and you and, could use a hand <laughs> and that joke will never get old and she like she ends up opening the um, opening the doors, breaking breaking them out of prison, and uh, they there's they're kind of they're sneaking along the um, they're like they're sneaking through the thing, but like Nimona just doesn't give a fuck and is like destroying as much as she can. Mm-hmm. So he's being all stealthy and stuff like that, and she's like knocking over spears and like pouring coffee all over like a, a computer. <laughs> it's a good to laugh. Destroy everything, and, and the, the more you learn about her, the more you're like, yeah, actually, she's right. Yeah. She's right for the whole time, and he's trying so desperately to be like, no, if I can be quiet and if I can just get out and I can prove myself, it'll be fine. And she's just like. She knows the system is broken. She knows. Yeah. There's I thought. No hope. I thought it was actually quite clever how um, how that aspect of it was shown because he is he is he's very naive and still kind of believes in the system, and mm-hmm. I think Nimona comes on very strongly that if you're not already on that the system's kind of like messed up or fucked side, a. Uh, you can see why he he didn't immediately believe her and he was kind of like put off by it a little bit uh, because she immediately wanted to start wrecking things even though she was in the right because the system is fucked Mm -hmm. you can see why he was a bit like not wanting to engage on that the no good cop it struck me as very anti-cop anti-copaganda it was very much well i can fix the system from the inside i can be one of the good ones when in reality with you know police and everything else the good ones either get driven out or they get killed like they're it's yeah. not that the phrase no good cop doesn't come from nowhere yeah. um, and it really does come from like he still thinks he can change the system if he just if he tries hard enough he can change an entire system which is not how it works and yeah. you see his boyfriend having a sort of similar kind of not as strong crisis until like breaking point yeah but you can see going through the same mental shift of like oh my god what are we doing yeah um but everyone else is shown to be very happy to uphold the system they're shown to be very happy to be like well if you're doing if you've got nothing to hide you've nothing to fear and like if you you know if you're not a monster why would you be afraid um ignoring the fact that the system makes monsters out of people yeah you know it's very very telling it's very well done i thought um because that's what the knights are they're essentially a regular you know, and I thought, oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're police. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're, police. They're, they're police. Yeah. And, um, I mean, like, well, kind of skip over, but basically they escape um, and they end up destroying the entire kind of palace while they escape. 
Um, and then the they come across some evidence. Uh, they encounter someone who has video evidence of the director. The yeah, the squire, who is the he ha- he has video evidence of the director of the institute, which is the 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 night police, basically, uh, that keep the people safe because the city is surrounded by a wall and no monsters get in. I think uh, it's weird actually because I've been watching a little bit of. Um, attack on titan i've just mm-hmm. been kind of like idly watching that um and that also has a wall with baddies on the outside i was weird immediately so going hey, i've kind of there's some parallels um but yeah there's the evil police there um and the yeah so this video evidence they go and confront it and this is like the you know planting the seed in the mind of the boyfriend uh ambrosius golden line when like they see that they've got this evidence and then immediately it gets destroyed because the knights shoot the phone and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um but like yeah, I'm I'm just thinking I'm gonna try to get the order of the story right. Cause they they, they go through like again, I don't want to say so much of the plot that we're doing it scene by scene. But it, it, from... the, when the squire comes out, when the squire comes out with the information, and they up, they upload it to the equivalent of YouTube, and it goes viral, and people get rightfully angry at the director. No, they they don't upload that video. They do the other do one. Do they not? Yeah, they do the one where they they go to the director's oh, office. Oh, that's right, the one where they trick her into yeah. admitting. Yeah. So because um, Nimona's a shapeshifter, she takes the form of Ambrosius, who confronts her about what has happened um Mm -hmm. and she stab she stabs nimona as ambrosius uh and you know goes on a big kind of evil person speech about how uh, she killed the queen doing it to protect the sanctity of their way of life and this is this is the part that i thought was really interesting and really reflects quite kind of contemporary politics because like this is someone caught on camera and immediately it was changed to be all oh, like i mean obviously there's a bit of magical she's a shapeshifter here but this is the kind of worry where someone will do something and be caught and claim it's deep faked yeah like this is a hundred percent what's gonna happen someone will actually be caught doing something it's it's not even about someone not doing something and someone deep faking that they did it's the reverse. Someone will claim that, you know, oh, I didn't say that. It was deep faked. If they get any backlash, or oh, you know, I didn't <laughs> didn't kill those people. It was a deep fake. Um, so she immediately kind of like gets out of it because I think the people are mm-hmm. up in arms when they see this recording, and then the there's almost like an immediate oh, it was it was just fake, and the entire it's population news. calms down again. Yeah, it's, it's fake news. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a, it was a very good way of showing how fascism rises very quickly yeah. in authoritative states. It was very well done in terms of how you perpetuate fear and you turn it. So I saw an interesting post the other day about nine eleven and how a lot of teenagers don't really un- like today. They had they have no mm. context for it because they didn't understand what the world was like before nine yeah. eleven. They didn't understand that there were actually the world. You know, since then, the world was better before nine eleven. Obviously, all these horrific people. You know, horrific thing that happened. Some people died, and then it just plunged us into a continual war that has been ongoing for longer than most young people have been alive for now. Yeah. But like they have no context for what the world was like before we started goose stepping our way towards fascism instead of actually making a better society. We responded to a tragedy with authoritarian violence and it yeah. did not make the world better. It has made it worse. I mean we invaded Iraq um, over it. <laughs> they had fuck yeah. all they had fuck all to do with it. But yeah. we invaded Iraq over it because someone had to pay. One of the things I think quite interesting is that like and I learned this probably in the past year or two but the whole like paying for your luggage on a plane was introduced yeah. post 9-11 mm-hmm. because it was a way of like oh the airline industries really struggled after you know 9-11 
um, let's help these guys get back on their feet and we'll pay for luggage. It's like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? <laughs> we never had to take our shoes off at airports before. Yeah. You could, Nuts. but you could go with your family to the gate and see them off before that. Yeah, a lot of the TSA is pantomime. Um, it's it's as someone who is old enough. Like I was just old enough to be, I think I was sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. Um, I remember travel before that. I remember what it was like before we responded with, you know everyone gets their rights stripped away to protect to protect them and it's just like okay i this is not the future i wanted to live in but this is how the people in charge chose to respond they chose to respond by increasing their own power rather than how do we tackle what is happening it was a very direct you know it was used to fan the flames of um nationalism it was used to fan the you know fan the flames of like we want to have more control over our, our own people yeah. Um, and it's a very kind of. Um, sorry, I just saw someone saying they were born in 2003 and my brain short circuited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so old. Uh, but it's it, it, it's completely well to me. Like the, the amount of restrictions I had as a an immigrant coming into this country, I couldn't bring my partner into the UK because of the immigration laws that were put in place following that. Yeah. Um, and people are like, oh, but you're white. And it's like, yeah, we are. But it's it was easier for me to get into the US than for my to me to bring my partner into the UK because the UK was already starting to close borders. The yeah. UK was start was already pushing towards what we now see as these draconian anti immigration laws. Like our our um the immigration laws changed six weeks before my wedding and all of a sudden Mothman we had a whole life planned out and my entire life pivoted on a you know, on a dime. And it was like, oh, the UK government says no. Yeah. What do you, do? and I remember looking at that and I remember talking to a lawyer and the lawyer just kind of shrugged and he went, they don't want any more immigrants in a couple of years, they're going to make it so that no one can come in. And I remember my dad, not his best moment going, but he's white. You know, like oh he couldn't understand why privilege wasn't working in our favor. And it was the, you know, for a lot of people in, in my social circle, for a lot of them, for the first time, it was experiencing the, you know, the, the wider problem at hand. Where yeah. I had friends that were, you know, I had friends that were deported from the UK in the last couple of years because, you know, they were there legally, but they were told, no, your partner doesn't earn enough money, you have to leave. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very odd to be in the age where I remember things being better, but then to have grown up in a completely different world to be an adult in a completely different world yeah. and it, it's a weird situation to be able to say well you know even when I moved here there were certain people within our social circle that couldn't understand you know I was having to go through all these legal loopholes because they're like yeah no but then you know immigrants make it in all the time and it's just like they don't you just think they do because you're believing the propaganda being fed to you by conservative right-wing you know yeah. people that people that want to close the borders you're believing the lies that are being fed immigration is actually a very legal immigration is actually a very harrowing process illegal it's immigration fucking difficult. is 100 times worse yeah it's horrific anyone that can get in good for them yeah. if you can <laughs> if you can survive that you deserve everything you deserve the world um yeah. And it's it's so strange to see people going oh but the government says it's bad the government says that this is a thing and I'm like you're falling for it. You're falling for the propaganda. And the only thing you're upset about is that your privilege, you know, that was the problem like with my with my family. They couldn't understand why our white privilege wasn't working for us. And I'm going, because they've gone after everybody else that's brown, black, and now they're coming after everyone else who is under a certain, you know, class system. Because yeah. the reason we couldn't come in was because I earned two grand less than the asking to sponsor your spouse. Ah, but have you heard Rishi Sunak's got the the key to this? That so long as you have graduated from a top fifty university, you can come to the UK and apparently piss about for a number of years before even getting a job. And it's like because they only want a certain level of person uh, to to come to the UK. I think he actually I think it's something like a a high performance visa or something like that is what yeah. he's called it. And it's yeah. like, ugh. 
Um, and as people are pointing in the chat as well, disabled people often can't immigrate. I was yeah. very lucky. I passed my health exam when I came to this country because I lied. <laughs> they asked me questions and I'm like, they were like, can you work? And I was like, yeah, I can work. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and I, I can work. I can work for what works with me. I physically am no longer capable of doing what I used to do. Um, but at the time, I was well enough to pass. I'm not sure I would pass now. Um, and, but I'm in the system. My husband has a job. I work. Therefore, we are considered acceptable as long as I don't ever need financial assistance for my disabilities. If we do, we have to get divorced. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things that, you know, when you, as we started at this, you know, talking at the start of the podcast, when you live in a system that doesn't want you, it is very evident. Mm -hmm. and seeing Nimona just be so blatantly angry at everything in her world that was yeah. healing it was yeah. a very kind of when we you know there's a big thing with disabled people when we talk about our experiences people go well have you just tried having a better attitude have you just tried to fit in more you know if maybe if you were nicer people would be nicer to you and you're just like you're boiling with fury the whole time <laughs> when people are saying this to you because you're like I tried being nice it didn't it work. It didn't work. So now I'm just, you know, I will be the most pissed off cockroach version of myself because <laughs> that is what it's going to be that takes to survive. Like, yeah. you don't listen to me when I'm nice. Don't yeah. frame it as, you know, oh, they're just not listening to you because you have a bad attitude. They don't listen to us because they don't want us. And seeing Nimona be so blatant with that and, you know, calling out Ballister on his like she's like you're brainwashed man like you you're yeah. not seeing it you're you know There's... you're fully entrenched in what you think is a just system you want to believe so badly the world is just that you will refuse to see it and a... i just there's it was very feeling to me to watch it <laughs> yeah there's actually a really good bit when they uncover the kind of video evidence of the director that ballister still believes in the system because he now thinks it's one bad egg and thinks, mm -hmm. oh, the director's at the heart of it all, and this is this is where uh, Nimona goes. You're you're absolutely brainwashed. You should be questioning everything right now. You should be questioning the wall. And he's going, what the walls there to protect us from all the monsters outside? Mm -hmm. He's like, have you ever been beyond the wall? Of course not, because I don't want to be killed by the monsters. And it's like, or maybe it's all just fucking made up. Um, and it, or maybe it's, it's wall to keep you inside the system. Yeah, it's interesting that, like, I think the film does really well to, like, chip away at, like, Ballister goes through stages of getting his confidence in the system rocked by well, Nimona, you, you who's can, just yeah. determined as fuck to take it down. And it's, there, there's a there's a brilliant bit where he finally goes, you know what, fuck it. <laughs> and he, he gets really angry with his uh, boyfriend to cut his arm yeah. off. <laughs> Rightfully so, but I thought there was a really sweet moment where they meet up and he's being pissy and they order food at this tavern they're in, <laughs> but he still loves him enough to go, no olives, he's allergic. Like, he's still... <laughs> yeah. he's, like, he's angry, but he knows him well enough to be like, I don't want you to die in front of me right now. Like, that's... Yeah. You know, that, that was very sweet to me. That was a very... It showed the depth of the relationship because you can be very pissed off at someone and be like... Yeah, don't put the, the food they're allergic to on their food, please. As much as I hate him right now, I don't want him paid. Uh, yeah. I, I love that. I thought that was just a lovely little touch from that as well. But yeah, it's Ballister fully goes through multiple stages of grief in about three minutes. So you see the <laughs> expressions. You can see him going through yeah. denial, acceptance, rage, denial. You can see the, the non-linear process of his thought pattern. And eventually he comes out on, fuck it. Like and it's it's very liberating to see him do that. Like he still yeah. believes that if they persevere, they will win. And it's not until he realizes that the rock goes the whole way down that he actually has like a his villain origin story moment. Yeah. That it's actually him rising up to defeat them. Yeah, it's really good. And um, I think it is it is something the the film does pretty well. There's there's a couple of areas from a plot perspective where it didn't work as well for me because I think there's there's a bit when they're on the subway like pretty early on in the film where Ballister's trying to get to know Nimona and Nimona's very um, kind of like jokey and kind of like makes fun of like an origin story for her 
Like, mm-hmm. so she's explaining to him, he's like, oh, well, I went to a wishing well. Uh, you know, she's like, I was a wee girl and I was coming through the forest and I saw there was this wishing well there. And, you know, all of a sudden a coin peered in my hand and I threw it in and I wished that one day I would be sat on a subway explaining this to like <laughs> a, a fucking boring cunt. Um, she doesn't say that. Uh, this is a PG film. Um so there is that kind of like jokiness where she's seen as kind of like a chaotic entity more than anything. But mm-hmm. then but then the film gives her an origin story, which like, yeah, it kind of does make her a bit more endearing. So it turns out that Nimona um really was a shapeshifter, really struggled to make friends with any anyone. So you see her as she tried to be a fish and the fish didn't speak to her. She tried to be a deer and the other deer didn't speak to her. Um, and then she sees this uh, wee girl playing by uh, a wishing well and she she takes the form of a, a, a wee girl and they become good friends and they're laughing together and you see them, their friendship kind of blossom and grows. Um, and then you see that she, she shows the girl her shape-shifting powers and they're having a laugh. She's a horse and the girl's like riding on the back of her and all this kind of stuff. And then the townspeople uh, overreact uh, to her. And, uh, they see her say- her shape-shifting. Yeah, they see her shape-shifting. She's playing with uh, the the blonde girl as, as a bear, and then suddenly the blonde girl's ripped away by her parents, who are really, really scared, and the townsfolk surround her and start to try and stab uh, Nimona. And, you know, Nimona's sh- shape-shifting through all the different forms in a panic. She's the wee lassie, and then she's a, she's a kitten trying to escape the pitchforks and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then... When w- one of the villagers tries to attack her, they like slip and fall, and one of them has a torch, and it hits the the dry hay beside her, and it sets fire to the whole fucking town. Um, so absolutely nothing to do with uh, Nimona's fault whatsoever. Um, but and I I thought fair enough. That's a, that's like a good story about. Like in uh, lots of people in chat are saying there's quite a like kind of allegory for coming out here, um, and I thought okay that's fine as is you know the parents like ripping their child away and you know oh the outsider we don't trust the outsider that kind of thing she's a monster, but then they made the blonde lassie, young Glorith who apparently set up the city and raised the walls and fought back against the the evil because. Like and maybe we've maybe we've neglected to say this so far, but the mythology of the city is that it was founded by Glorith, who fought back against a terrible monster, and Glorith then made the the Institute of Knights. So like that's the whole mythos of the city, and I was just really I I do not know why they made the the young blonde lassie Glorith, because for me it. I don't know, it almost took it away from it a little bit. Or they didn't embellish it enough. There, was, yeah. there wasn't an aftermath to that. Like, because the whole point is, is like, the, the, the young blonde lassie is a young blonde lassie and she holds up a wooden sword and apparently says, go back from whence you came at our friend who she's just been ripped away from because, mm-hmm. her, because her parents have said she's a monster. And she's like the, the she's been mythologized as like a, a full adult who fought back against a dragon, mm-hmm. uh, and I think I think it's an interesting allegory for. So I I, I need I need more time to fully conceptualize this thought, but I think she's a really interesting focal point for the weaponization of white women tears. I think she's mm. a very apt analogy for how things that are not you know like women there's a history of white women involved in white supremacy that a lot of people you know think oh well these poor women they're being hounded by these men really a lot of these women are very happy to go along with the power dynamic as long as they get something out of it as long as they are held above others and i can see it kind Mm -hmm. of being a you have you're friends with this person and your parents go, no, it's a monster. And you can be like, no, 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 that's my friend. And then you see the reaction of the people around you is so over the top and it's so terrifying that 
as a child you would internalize oh my god this person is the reason that this people are so scared they must be a monster yeah and i i can see that being a very kind of not to bring jk rowling into it but i can kind of see it as the pipeline for how turfs and you know white supremacy go hand in hand i can see that being where that is aiming for and how it becomes mythologized and built up and oh well she fought against the terror and it's like it's completely taken out of hand and it comes into this whole thing in which our system is built on oppression i could see that being what they're aiming for but i do think there needed to be more you know why glorith how glorith came to be the powerful person she is from the child holding a wooden sword like i think it's very Someone, someone in chats yeah. mentioned it. Like, is she at a young enough age that she could have, like, almost have her memories kind of like toyed with by adults who said, "Well done on standing Possibly. up to that terrible beast." It's like, yeah. see if they'd, see if they just had a small scene that actually explained that a little bit. Because for me, it didn't make sense that they were absolute best friends, and then in the space of about two minutes, the the like. Because I think the Glorith at that point, young Glorith, is like cut off from the townspeople because there's fire everywhere. And she Mm -hmm. stands up alone against her friend who's in the form of a bear at this point, being like, go back from whence you came. It it just, I don't know. We're we're also remembering it from Nimona's point of view and Nimona is traumatised. So is is Nimona Mm -hmm. remembering multiple battles all at once is she remembering the rejection all at once like you know it's a very interesting like Nimona is shown to have a very at that time very is an innocent trust in people which to me it, it struck a new, neurodivergent chord to me where you think everything's fine and then your best friend turn around, turns around and goes I literally wish you were dead and you don't know why yeah that could be part of it as well. It can be that I, I miss something. I don't understand what I miss, but all of a sudden the reaction is so extreme. I'm the monster. People yeah. don't want me. Uh, it's a, it is interesting. I do think there needed to be more time with it, but I also think there's multiple ways to read into it, and I think it will speak to certain like, people that will understand what it's like to have the person you trust, the person you love, turn on you. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's... Yeah, I... Yeah. Okay, we'll go with we'll go with that. I think that's that's probably yeah. a good way. Nah, it's probably a good way around it. Yeah. But yeah, I just yeah, I'm not sure if am I expecting too much of an animation film to show me that little bit more. I I thought it was going to be a little bit more literal in terms because you see the the thing that gets me is that it's a time lapse when she's remembering, so you do see her friendship with Glorith building up. And it mm-hmm. seems a bit strange to have that completely toned down in such a short space of time without without this kind of like, I don't know, without showing us this kind of like parental indoctrination. Because uh, I think this does have a bit of religious, there is a religious aspect. There's a lot well. of religious trauma. <laughs> if There's... you have religious trauma issues, you may wish to go in. Yeah. Um, bracing yourself. There's there a lot of lot religious of imagery in it as well. Glorith is seen as this like great savior of the people, uh, kind of stuff. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah. So after, like, basically, the the director of the institute, who's killed the queen, who's set all this bad stuff up, who's now kind of saved their own skin by saying that. It was a, it was a, essentially a deep fake. Um, she kind of proclaims that the two of them are enemies of the the people. Uh, Ambrosius goes to meet with Ballister. That's when they have that tavern scene with the the nachos and the olives. Um, and then a uh, Ballister almost has this reaction against Nimona from that. He's kind of been set off again because. And it is, like, to be honest, it's quite a good twist. It does kind of push and pull, like, has Nimona actually been the bad person all along? Because Mm -hmm. there's a prophecy that's been foretold and there's, like, an ancient city document in which it shows Nimona as a wee girl inside this big dragon uh, destroying a town. Um, And then... It's religious propaganda against the outsiders. And it's it's so deep-seated in their society that they literally build a giant super weapon into their city 
Yeah, it's like they've got <laughs> they've basically got gun turrets all around the city walls. Um and Nimona in a kind of a almost like extreme sadness decides to turn into her largest monster form and mm-hmm. basically march from inside the city towards the golden statue that's been made of Glorith with her sword out. Um and she's basically trying to get there. And <laughs> this is where it goes nuts and like <laughs> the police are everywhere. They've got drone strikes. I was like, this is this is so close to like contemporary like a reaction. <laughs> um but like all the police are directing like strikes on this and it's like they're doing strafing runs and it's very like it is like full on if you've ever seen any kind of footage of like a like a bombing run or anything like that Mm -hmm. they're 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 bombing uh uh, nimona into the ground i had to check her name there um they're like they're, they're bombing her as she's kind of marching towards the statue um and you know, people are screaming, and there's a monster alert, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's very, it is a very kind of, and the thing is, the wall does nothing to stop her. Like that's such a wonderful moment. Like, oh, I, the wall, does fuck she, your wall. Does she? Does she break the wall? It seems like she kind of she goes she, straight through. It. She's just smoke. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure if the, the, the wall f- does nothing. I wasn't sure if the forest she was hiding in was inside the city. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, uh, yeah, it does fuck all, and she basically marches down the high street towards this statue, um, and you know it's almost trigger like trigger warning for anyone that she Nimona intends to you know it's a suicidal attempt. Yeah, she and basically it, aims. If you to, are watching it, and you like, are in a bad place. That may hit. Well, there's a reason for why the it's you know at the end of the credits there is that if you are struggling with thoughts of depression and harming yourself, reach out to these. Yeah. places it is a very poignant narrative about that i fully teared up when i was watching that because it's you have nimona going through all of her emotions and you hear her talking you know you hear her thoughts that she's already said to baluster you know the, you know some of the most terrible things are all these people that want to put a sword in my heart because they think i'm a monster and then you have her saying and sometimes mm. the worst part is i want to let them yeah and it's really difficult to watch that. It's very difficult to watch, you know, the kind of the outsider just being like, yeah, yeah, I must be a monster. I, I'm sick and tired of being a monster. Um, because there, there is this kind of, in within our own communities, there is a very kind of like, oh, you're going to treat me like a monster? Fuck you, I'll be a monster. And it's a very kind of like fierce, angry joy a lot of the time. Mm. But then other times it will just wear you down and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be the monster. Um, and that really hit home for me or someone that's always, you know, I'm always constantly being told, maybe if you were nicer, people would be nicer to you. And it's like, I am nice to people. I'm not nice to people that are able as bigoted fucks. That's, that's it. The people that I am not being nice to are never going to be nice to me. Yeah, and you have Nimona coming to that realization of like, oh, like even the people who she thought were her friends will turn on her. So what's the point? Yeah, uh, it's it's harrowing to watch. It is very well done. Um, and it is yeah. it is Ballister that ends up saving her, as in kind of causing her to feel that way in the first place. But he does then kind of come around and he he literally stands on the tip of the sword of this statue and I'm I'm guessing that's touching her heart. I think it's mm-hmm. it's a very l- literal kind of symbolism. Um it's, to me it was fantastically done because the focus isn't on his abled arm holding her back. It's yeah. his amputated arm, it's his disabled arm, it's him going, Oh actually I am outside the system. That to me was just mm. such a wonderful moment you had someone else that has been forcibly moved outside the system someone who's had their power stripped of them and he's using the power that he's built for himself literally built himself an arm and he's using that to hold her back and to say i'm so sorry i see you i was in tears i might actually (laughs) cry again but i was just like oh yeah that is actually how it works when you find your community and you find your people it is life-saving and the film does that the, the you know it does that part really really well um 
yeah i it was very emotional i was very much like oh okay yeah that's that's <laughs> fine just i wasn't using my heart it's fine um, <laughs> and then like the film kind of culminates in this like i'd say the final action scene is nimona actually she doesn't quite give her life but it's kind of heavily implied um that she, she sacrifices herself she's, to save the city because, because the director turns the guns inside the city and yeah. would kill a bunch of people uh, but that, and that's a really good turning point for um golden line the boyfriend yeah because he has a moment where he's like people are gonna die and the director's like so so will the monster and it's such a good response for how fascism and like all these things work because they literally don't care how many yeah. of their own people they kill as long as they maintain the status quo. They don't care. You saw it with Trump. Like people were like, when when Trump was in power, you had all these people going like, he doesn't care how many people die of COVID, as long as he gets to maintain his illusion of power. And it's like, oh yeah, like where are all these people that were always the obviously the bigots are still there, but it's like the voting is significantly down because how many of them died? How many of them drank bleach because they had this monster telling them, do so what do I it. do and you'll be you know? It was and meanwhile he's not actually doing any of that. Nah. He's following recommended health. You know, it's it was such a good moment where you had Golden Line, he just stands there in the middle of the chaos and he's like, What are we doing? Like he literally says, What are we doing? And you see his moment of like, fuck, I'm part of a corrupt system. I believed as long as you did the right thing, the system would be okay. Like it it was such a good moment. No, I think I've lost you. No, no, sorry, I was briefly muted. Um, the yeah, so I, I, the ending, the ending was like that bit was good. I like, I like that bit of the ending, um, but the like, I don't know how I felt about like the last five minutes, um, where like the. You know, you see them recycling all the weapons from the walls, uh, being chucked in the dumpster, and you see the walls opening, uh, and things like that. And like that's all good, but I suppose I didn't see the the sweeping societal change in the same way. Obviously, like the you see people leaving lots of um, like flowers and stuff to Nimona. Uh, but the like all the police are still there and they're, but they're now playing football with the kids it's yeah i just thought it was like it was a little bit odd um felt very um like wrapped up in a bow if so yeah I, I that's exactly it, what it was <laughs> it was very short the ending was very short for what it needed to be mm. um and it was just like it's very kind of like wrapped up in a bow it's you know it's all done everything's fine yeah. and i I, pre- I i can understand why they had a lot yeah. of production problems they had a lot of stuff they had to try and fit in there was budgeting issues as well um uh, but it's it still felt kind of like oh everything's fixed now even like the the, yeah. you know, the broski night was just like hey buds like he was just like completely reformed and i'm like that's not how that works. You don't just kill the one bad person. I think, you have to literally dismantle the whole system. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, that's how... I mean, if you're going to have a PG animated film, it can't... It, it can't give the... Like, it can be satisfying, but it doesn't give you the same gratif- <laughs> like gratification of maybe a film that could be a little bit more adult in its way of a, a purge of the current system uh, but yeah everyone was everyone was friendly all of the police were uh, were like that were assaulted throughout the film were uh, were just assaulted they only had you know you you see a lot of them walking around with casts on their arms which i thought was kind of funny and there's a bit where nimona as a beaver is biting her way through the cast of one of the police which i think is quite funny um <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's I, I yeah, it was it was just it was wrapped up in the bow a little bit too mm-hmm. much for me at the end. I'm, um, I'm reading but, Lysander Salomon in the comments said it was in developmental hill. Disney bought the animation company and oh, they cancelled the movie when it was at eighty percent complete and shut down the studio. That may explain some of it. 
<laughs> that is, yeah, I can see that being part of the pacing issues, and it's like, Fuck. oh, we've got eighty percent of this done, and then it's just wiped out. So, I mean, how did it get made then? I'm guessing they made it was like eighty percent done. We have to wrap up, or it was it? Yeah. Because not... I mean, it's still it's still got a release, obviously, and it's not. Yeah. It's not on Disney Plus, so it must be. Yeah, bought by Netflix, so maybe I, I don't know. But that that would ex- I mean, f- the, considering that happened, cracking good film. Yeah, absolutely great. Oh no, you. I've seen things that where it goes to budgeting hell, and you're just kind of left watching. It looks like shaky cam almost. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, the person's trying to finish this on their iPhone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the it's the it was good. I thought I thought it was good, although the ending was a wee bit kind of. Yeah. I, 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 that makes more sense now that I know that. Yeah. Um, I kind of. Yeah. Like the 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 uh, the only other thing that I would say that kind of bugged me about it because we saw, I'm I'm going back to the origin story when you saw young Glorith, I'm annoyed that there wasn't any, like full circleness for that bit particularly because it was Glorith's descendants who are all the knights and the director was just another person. I almost wish that like if Glorith had been there and this had been like a almost a shorter story uh, as in like because apparently the wall has been up for a hundred years at this point so mm-hmm. obviously N- uh, Nimona's not shapeshifted or like not aged um, or well she's a shapeshifter so it doesn't fucking matter but uh, you know there wasn't oh it was a thousand years sorry my bad fuck that's even worse <laughs> I kind of wish there'd just been some sort of like full circleness with the like Glorith story side of it but at the end of the day, still a very good film. I would recommend it. Yeah. Um, it's a good watch. Just have a box of tissues with you because if you're <laughs> anything like me, you will start like legitimately bawling at one point. I was like, thank God I did not put my makeup on before watching this. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I would have looked like a panda. Which is <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's a it's a good film. I was I I'm a, a emotionless stalwart throughout these films, obviously. <laughs> Nothing ever gets to me, um, but no, it was uh, it was good. Uh, I can't believe we were able to slip in a little bit about uh, fascism, a little bit about nine eleven into that slipping, assessment. Yeah. Of- <laughs> I know um, but it really hits on a lot of things. It really hits on the media that is. It almost felt like a direct rebuttal against a lot of the the propaganda stuff that has sprung up since nine eleven. Because I felt like a lot of the media that I had in my late teens was mm. very much conform, conform, conform. Whereas before that, it was yeah, man, fuck the, like I the, the movies that I grew up watching like from just before my age was like yeah, man, fuck the system, be an individual. And now it's yeah. like very, it, the the shift towards procedural crime stuff, and you know, the good guys always hunting down the bad guys. That to me, it was a very notable shift in my childhood media watching mm. and now it, that was refreshing to see something be actually yeah the system is actually corrupt you it's, burn it down. it's funny how like i'd say over over the years in fact probably in the past in the past 10 years maybe for me there's been this like distinct change that n- now whenever i see the kind of noble knights of the realm depicted in any sort of media i'm like mm-hmm. they're evil bastards aren't they they're a hundred percent the worst fucking people on the planet uh, and it, it tends to be right so it was it was nice having an animated film do that because i think a lot of animated films tend to be a lot tamer in their messaging obviously because it is for kids but it was nice to see nimona have usually that a bit kids, of, yeah mm-hmm. like you know a bit more of that kind of angst um also thought that the art style was quite it was it was a weird fusion i definitely saw some like pixar wide eyeness that they do yeah. um like you know i saw that a couple of times but then uh, at other times i saw you know you could definitely see the influences from like spider-verse stuff yes um and i feel like i thought, I thought um castlevania too a little bit yeah I could see flashes of that occasionally, and I don't know if it's just because it was a maybe Netflix finished it off. That could be why. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting. I will say again, if you're thinking of watching it, if you have migraines or seizures, you may wish to, you know, don't do it in a dark room because there mm. is there is strobing effects. Um, that that was yeah. one thing that I was like, I'm going to watch this in a fully lit room to minimize <laughs> the amount of light contrast. 
But no, um, I have to do that with a lot of media now. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mind that. It's quite flashy. Right, on to... Should we get our ukuleles out? <laughs> I am so glad to say I don't have a ukulele. Because you, it means oh. I will never, ever use it to make... I don't even know where to begin with this next topic. Okay, all um, I'm... Okay, all, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off then. All I will say is if you want to give a solid rebuttal to child sexual assault allegations don't do it through the medium of song don't <laughs> 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 just at, at all don't do don't do it through the medium of song and don't set the fucking ukulele um which i feel like every single kind of yeah absolutely so not sh- for anyone that's not aware calling Ball- ballinger yeah, who is yeah. Melissa Sims on YouTube, very prominent YouTuber, who has the dubious honour of apparently being the worst person Shane Dawson has ever met. <laughs> Isn't he the didn't fuck his cat guy? Yes. Uh, Love it here in the world. Um, I shouldn't know about I, these people, Joy. I should. Be, I. I. I, sh- I shouldn't be online enough to know about these people. This sucks. Um, <laughs> it, there's been allegations for a couple of years that um, Melissa Sings or Colleen, Colleen Ballinger um, is inappropriate with her young fan base. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of them because some of them are quite graphic, but it's all over the internet at the minute. There's been allegations that she was touching them inappropriately, that she was texting them inappropriately. And there was another call out in the last week or so, and she was basically advised by her legal team to not talk about it. Yeah. And her response to that was to go, I was told I couldn't talk about this. No one said I couldn't sing about it and pull out a ukulele and then for 10 minutes just strummed away gaslighting everybody involved and being I- like, oh, but, you know, it's the toxic gossip trait. It's, you know, it, it's such an earworm too. I fucking hate how catchy it is. But it was like, it was implied to people, it's fake news. Everyone's I, talking badly about me. You shouldn't believe it. And it's just like... I, I have seen people making TikToks with it as the song in the background. And you know, like a, a good way, a good, a good test if your apology is uh, received well or not. Um, if it's received badly more people now know about the allegations against you than before. <laughs> um, I had no fucking idea who this person was until yeah. I saw her burn her fucking ukulele everywhere. It's... I, 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 and then I went on a deep dive because I figured we would be talking about it this week and I was just losing my faith in humanity very rapidly after that. But I was... watched so many T channels. I don't normally do <laughs> T channels. I watched a bunch and I came out going, I don't want to be on this planet anymore i'm going to mars see you later i just how can you possibly think it's okay but i mean any of that? but the worst thing about that is when when you do when you do something as stupid as that right like again just to reiterate for anyone who didn't hear us she pulled out a ukulele and sang about her child abuse allegations uh, in the form of a I'm so clumsy and oh my life has been on the internet for so long I've been sharing my life with you for years now etc etc um like when you do something like that people are going to dig into the rest of your life and the amount of people who have like worked with her in the past been in the same vicinity of her as the past like She's now be like now. There's way more allegations out there. Husband is talking out about her. Yeah, like, like I just yeah. There was the there was the article that I sent you from the um the showrunner who worked on one of her shows. She was like an assistant there, and you know she's <laughs> she's got on record of like um apparently for one of her TV shows they were gonna convert uh like an Asian family shop into a, like a, a bodega because uh, she didn't she didn't want all the Asian stuff in the in the shots but for to, her to show. Quote the article you sent me, get all that Asian shit out of here. There we go. 
Um, she's a piece of shit. And even it's like were, even if she wasn't allegedly a child groomer or whatever, she's a piece of shit for being a racist piece of shit. Yeah, there's just it's... so many levels of shit that I'm just like, how? It, but again, that's like the Shane Dawson effect. It's like, how are these people not facing lasting consequences for actions that are documented? Yeah, and like uh, in that article that I sent you, I'll, I will post it in uh, in uh, the Discord after this. Um, but it was is the the author's the author's black, and apparently Miranda Sings had no issue like using the N word like with a hard R around her. It is it's honestly it's fucking bonkers, right? And it's like how do you how do you get to the point in your life, right? where you're such a fucking asshole to everyone that you think an apology via ukulele sing song is like remote remotely appropriate if, like if i I've, i know that i would never get to that point because joy would shoot me in the face before i got to that point <laughs> <laughs> like I, 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 i'm I never <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna add it to your throne wish list joy <laughs> One ukulele. ukulele, but yeah, it's, it's like, I and there is this. I, I saw it. Do, who was the guy I saw yes, like yesterday? He was on TikTok, and I was like, I can't believe he's still alive. Um, it was like Ray William Johnson. He was like one of mm. the really, really early YouTubers. Um, and he made he, he had, it was like a TikTok video. It was like seeing seeing early YouTubers being cancelled for views they've heard in the past. And he, it was just like a you know he was just doing a kind of oh hope they don't come and get me kind of face. And it's like he's definitely got skeletons on his closet as well. We're coming after all of them. Yeah, uh, and there is fuck. a very with YouTubers. There is a very kind of they do, they do get found out again and again and again as yeah. people are commenting in the, in the notes. And then nothing really seems to happen. But they like but, to cry a lot about cancel culture. Yeah, um, and that's what and that article was, was yeah. on about. It's like, you know, cancel culture doesn't really exist for people like that because the like it's almost like a wave of pressure that they get in a short space mm-hmm. of time and then they, they almost get like a reset. Um, and I think also because of how polarising social media tends to be, uh, if someone does something bad initially, there is a wave of people who obviously point out that this is a, a bad thing. But there's always people who go, actually, I'm going to defend the person because I don't like the people who are calling out. And, mm-hmm. like, you know, it's... I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a... Like, I'm not a massive fan of South Park, but there is a, a South Park episode where they talk about, like, social media discussions and they talk about how the idea with social media is that you've got a bunch of people who aren't angry about the actual subject. They're angry at the people on the other side who are like pushing back. Yeah. Uh, and it just builds up because then you've got people who push back against the folk who push back against the folk who push, and, you know, so on and so forth. And mm-hmm. it's like, ugh. But, and there's also, as Raspberry T just pointed out in the chat, people also get desensitized toward it. It just yeah. becomes... It's like a show you're watching. It's not real anymore. And I think that's honestly one of the more harmful things about YouTubers and certain styles of family vlogging and like, here's every aspect of my life in mm. totality. Like here, but they're not being themselves. They're being a character. Yeah. But then when they are being themselves, people are like, oh, it's just a character. It's just a show. But this and is the thing. Like, this yeah. is the thing that really annoys me because that can also be done for tax reasons um for yes. for anyone for anyone in the uk uh, you might watch the show lorraine kelly i certainly don't but lorraine kelly effectively argued in court that she's playing the character lorraine kelly on her show and it's therefore a separate entity and not herself which is yeah. fucking just ridiculous um and also Joy, i'm not sure if you saw the there was a there was a lorraine kelly video actually out um she was interviewing this woman who's apparently she's basically rewritten men are from mars women are from venus but in uh in like a more reductive in modern times kind of way um like what we need like basically basically echoing all the um 
oh, you know, men, men can't talk about stuff. Men, and like, she's, she's not saying it from a, um, like, they shouldn't talk about stuff. She's saying, oh, men find it really difficult to talk about stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, me, you know, you know what we need? You know what men need? Men need the equivalent of the women's toilets because every woman who goes into the women's toilets makes like best friends and they can talk about all of their problems in the women's toilets and it's just like how fucking like narrow-minded and like reductive <laughs> at the moment in time it's just honestly it's terrible she, she's like saying what men need is the is is, is a situation where they can act like they're in a women's toilets and talk amongst each other. And it's like... For uh, anyone not watching this, for anyone listening on the podcast, you can visibly see me going through every stage of grief known to man. <laughs> it's just like, how? How do... Like, I feel like... There's this. So she's like... She, she talks about problems with masculinity, right? And of course, that's kind of standard. One thing that I think is an issue with masculinity at the moment is that there is lots of different ways that you can be a, a man there's lots of different avenues um but i think from a societal perspective um there is this kind of perceived only way to be a man and that's being th that's being infiltrated by certain people who deem themselves as like al alpha male or whatever the alpha it's, holes, yeah. it's like it's it's your it's your Andrew Tates that see themselves as like the chief influencers of that particular way to be a man, right? And that's what makes it like toxic. There's lots of guys. Alpha that, masculinity yeah. is so fucking fragile. It's and it embarrassing. hinges really on the oppression of everyone else. It hinges it's fully weak as fuck. on I have no character of my own, therefore I will make sure everyone else is a blank cardboard slate for me to oppress that is purely what alpha masculinity is yeah um i hate it i hate it it's a big part of the industry i'm in for romance um it drives me up the wall so i someone sent me a review they did recently a wonderful review and they were like it's just a shame that both characters are betas both male characters me meaning my, See, my main character even kind of black. even I'm like even that language is fucking annoying like the label, like that labeling system is the worst thing that's ever happened to yeah. discussions around this. Um, like, I, don't get me wrong, I like, I totally understand in the uh, Omega Verse world that it's like it's its own thing, but like applying, yeah. like, you know. But my, really, my men fucking... are not toxic, therefore they're not alpha heroes, they're beta heroes. heroes. And I'm yeah. sitting there going, they're just men. <laughs> they're just innocent they're just, men they're just guys they're just two guys they're just them alone. Uh, hanging about um, <laughs> but it was such a weird thing to have it be i wish there'd been more alphas in the story yeah. about werewolves i'm going okay sure but it's no it's not tagged anywhere as a megaverse <laughs> and but the the fact that the men are not toxic enough for you that's that's where you you're not happy yeah. with it i was like I can't relate to straight women. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I just, it's a completely other world where I'm like, what planet do you live on where you want men to be monstrous to you so that you can fix them? I know it's the reflection of their reality. I know that's what it is. Straight women yeah. read monster fucker fiction because they believe that they can make the men better. Us queers read it because we are the monsters and we want to be represented. That's, <laughs> that is the and we want to fuck them. <laughs> we want to fuck them. Um, and it's or just love them or hold their hand if you're if you're ace or whatever. But it's just it's it's such a weird thing when I when I find myself in straight circles, which is not often anymore. Mm. And it's you know your men are quite so, feminine, and it's just so, like are they right? Well, this is interesting. I was I was speaking about this earlier uh, with Arascala, and so I've I've unfortunately been spending way too much time on TikTok recently, and I'm glad that I've got lots of friends who aren't in this. Like you know, I've obviously got straight friends, but I think a lot of people I, t I talk to tend to be more on the uh, on the queer side of things. Um, that's a really bad phrasing. That's going to be taken out of context. Um, <laughs> but what? So apparently, like on TikTok, I find there's a lot of like straight women on TikTok who either specifically humiliate their boyfriend 
by pointing out like some of the nasty ass fucking shit that he does, right? Like there was there was a call out where it was like, oh my, like my boyfriend doesn't clean his arse properly. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, why are you, why are you putting this on? Te-? Like first of all, why are you with him? If he's, if he, <laughs> but saying it's like you know she was she like. That that was one of them. Another one I saw was uh, this this lassie who who like marked the the soap in the shower, and then uh, to see if he was using soap, yeah. To see if he was using soap, and you know she she asked him, and he was like, "Yes, I used the soap." And then she was like, "Well, let's go and see." And she she walked him into the shower and took him, and it was like one that's obviously humiliating as fuck for him, but two what why 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 are you not using soap jessica's saying mind the one with the stairs and i'm not sure which one she means this is probably going to damage me this is going <laughs> to uh, the lassie okay girlfriend bf nah i'm it's not i'm, I'm not recalling it at all i'm what oh. your memory to protect yourself is what happened falling up the stairs Nah, I've got no idea what you're talking about, Jessica, sorry. There's there's definitely stuff that I've seen where it's yeah, it's just it's it's not good. I mean it's it's such <laughs> a weird like I, I don't understand <laughs> why you're with someone that drives you insane that way. But also there's a level of humiliation that goes with that that is not kind. Because you don't know if it's a case of this person has a major depressive episode and it's something they can't handle right now. You don't know if it's like a you know a sensory issue where mm. you know I have a friend who cannot stand showers because it's a sensory nightmare for for her. And her solution to that was actually to cut her hair off because it was the sensation of wet hair. She didn't know she was autistic at the time. Mm. But it was the sensation of the wet hair was like I can't handle, it, I can't do it. So she never washed her hair, and it was only when she got diagnosed and they're like, oh, it's probably a sensory issue. It was like okay. The accommodation to that was shave the head, so therefore you don't have to deal with the sensation. So to me, there's a level of like humiliation is it's perpetuating the toxicity as normal, but it's yeah. also perpetuating the humiliation of people that have problems that ne- they need help with. Yeah, as well. and it's it's a I, very I don't understand I, the appeal of that type of content at all. It's really uh, I, there's, it's what it's one thing yeah. if you're like hey oh, hey Reddit uh. I think my my boyfriend has a problem because he hasn't washed his arse in like ever. <laughs> and the advice should yeah. probably be, yeah, you should probably, especially when the response is, oh yeah, my partner says it's gay because you're touching your ass. Like that that that's like a valid <laughs> like. Relief. Have you not heard this? Okay. No. There was a lot of guys that were saying they don't wash their arses because touching it is like a gateway to being gay. But in that case, wanking's gay. But well, fuck off. Exactly. That's exactly. Silly. Oh, what? No, that's not right. That's no, no. That those people don't exist. Surely, touching your ass, washing your ass is gay. No, I mean, there are some people that are very paranoid about things. Irrational, you know, well, yeah, irrationality. Um, but it, it's a very like the bar is on the floor for some of these people, and you're going, what kind of childhood yeah. do you have where you put up with this sort of thing where you think this is normal? Yeah. And but as someone who comes from a kind of like questionable childhood, it, I can understand how you don't recognize red flags until it's a fucking parade. But there's some mm. of them that I'm just like, that's bad. That that is, if you're having to yeah. ask Reddit, should I leave my boyfriend because he doesn't use soap? I feel like you know the answer. Yeah, you're just delaying it because you want input. Um, I, I know. I know. I can only speak for myself here in a completely hypothetical situation where I'm a woman. But see the TikTok videos where guys film conversations with their with their significant other, but they like they put a dish towel over their head to play their girlfriend or their yeah. wife. Like I I hate I hate those videos so much. And I know that as a woman I would not be attracted to a guy who did that. And as a man I would say that's fucking weird. Why? 
Why are you doing it's it? It's also usually because they're pointing out something irrational their wife is doing. It's the shrill voice that they do. The moment the, the moment the, the moment the, the, the towel yeah. goes on, it's like they start speaking like that. It's like, you know, you could probably just film this from two sides and just use your normal voice and it would probably get the same point across. But yeah. it's the I, I've I've noticed it. It's a very kind of like, look how crazy my wife is. Oh and yeah, it's, like, it's boomer I humor. Them. I fucking hate them. It's it's um, it's like the the really shitty like boomer comics. I hate my wife. It is. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, and then oh another sorry another thing on TikTok that I utterly despise, and I know that this is stretching our topics, um, but there's there's this family that I've been seeing a lot, and it's like I've I've seen too many of their videos. The next time I see them, they're getting blocked, but. It's a family that obviously the whole family dynamic, kids as well, relies on pranking each other. But it's always the same prank. It's always a balloon and it's always filled with white paint. And it's like, and they, they, they always get like their floors and their walls just absolutely fucking covered because they, they basically, they shout someone through from another room and then they come in and then they use like a BB gun to shoot this balloon full of white paint and it all goes over them. And I'm like, I, I don't I know. It's like hate that. I, I I hate I hate pranks. I, I don't like any pranking content because it tends to be terrible. The only it tends to be cruel. Yeah, it tends to be cruel. Yeah. It tends to be harassing random people in the street. And the only good one I've seen was two guys who were obviously just good pals sitting at a restaurant and this group of kids were also at the restaurant and they ordered a milkshake with two straws to the table <laughs> and the the guys the, the, the guys like obviously they're a wee bit surprised and then they look around and they see this group of like wee kids all giggling and just recording it and they, they play it up and it was like okay that's a good prank because at least they're getting a milkshake out of it um yeah but yeah other pranks are there, terrible there, there are way there are there are good ways of pranking people that are not hurtful mm. but a lot of the content that goes viral is very very hurtful and i purposely if i see someone doing that type of channel i just block them immediately because i'm like yeah. i don't want you on my feed like the paint ones i've seen the paint ones as well and i think i saw the mum just screaming because she got paint up her sinuses and that hurts yeah like it... that causes damage to the the membrane of your nose Mm. And it's just like, I, I don't see the, I don't find it funny. Nah. And I don't understand people that do find people getting hurt funny. My mum's one of them. My mum will laugh until she falls over if someone slips in a banana peel. Um, but yeah. I've never found it particularly funny when people get hurt. Yeah. And a lot of the pranks revolve around harm, either yeah. emotional or physical. And I, I just, I, no, see, not for me. The weird thing is, is I've never liked stuff like that. There's plenty of films, uh, like, you know, kind of old, like Jim Carrey, Dumb and Dumber kind of films that rely. I flinch. So, I flinch when so, I watch them so much on that, and like I know that for a lot of people, that's maybe just like a nostalgic movie that they they enjoy. But like, um, I, I don't know. It's just I've never liked that type of of humor. And sorry, Salusha's just pointed out in chat the other acceptable prank video is when the the girlfriends of the wives all get together and they all buy their boyfriends and husbands the same shirt. And they, then they Those go, they go for a, <laughs> a night out. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant because they film each of the the boys like clocking on individually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just brilliant uh, so yeah those are the two acceptable prank ones there's probably other ones the ones that don't rely on people getting hurt uh, but yeah that's that's one that kind of plays up um, but yeah there's sorry we're, we were wanting to touch on kind of like aging semi gracefully on well, it comes, social it comes media into TikTok. it comes yeah. into TikTok and Instagram and all those things and it was actually something that I saw on um i occasionally watch tiffany reg on youtube she does internet analysis mm -hmm. and it's actually something that i've been seeing a lot of because i don't follow a lot of young influencers and it usually comes from a place of it's not good for me to watch you know there's a very real temptation to fall into the trap of look at all these very very young affluent tiktok or instagram stars Mm -hmm. and they always have this kind of you just got to hustle you just got to do the thing but it's also the the kind of the anti-youth culture that i'm getting into and i don't mean as an anti-young people as in the preservation of the preservation of youth has become really 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 toxic like it's always been bad mm. but i've noticed it on tiktok like 
you have people that are just like they never take the filters off because they're like oh i look so old yeah and, you know and it's like they're 20 something they're babies and they're talking about oh i get um you know i get um Botox injections to prevent me from ever getting wrinkles because I've, I'll never eat. I've it. already. Like, there's it's people so I. There's bad. people I know that do that. There's people I know yeah. who go and they're yeah. like, oh, I'm gonna get, like, I'm gonna get like preventative Botox. I think they call it, or is something mm-hmm. like that. It's preventative bo- Botox, yeah, because it'll yeah. stop the muscles from moving. Therefore, you'll never have lines. And I intentionally stopped following people that did that, even if I thought their content was funny. I intentionally was like, I'm disengaging yeah. from this because. One of the biggest insults I get on Tumblr is, well, you're just too old to be here. And I'm like, I'm 36. When I was your age, I was aware that my fandom was being built by a 36-year-old woman mm-hmm. that had kids and life experience, and they had the skill to do these things. But it's a, it's a real kind of like... Um, it, I, I've been getting a lot of them recently. It's been, well, how come you waited until you were so old to write fangs? And I sat there and I went, I'm not old. Yeah. And then I realized it's, you know, like I had, you know, I did a, um, I put a reel on Instagram where I was showing off my earrings that, you know, someone made for me. And I got a comment that I removed because the person was saying, you know, if you'd used a filter, we wouldn't see the lines around your eyes. That was what? the comment. It's like so fucking uninvited as well. Like, and who would you solicit there, that? And I, I don't know if you're listening, um, Dream Waffles. Dream Waffles is a friend that I've had since I was 17 online. We've been friends for uh, f- literally 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, they are younger than me. They've We've grown up kind of together. We grew up on the internet. We've been friends. Um, and I remember I posted a selfie on Tumblr and I had to like plaster dust on my face because I was renovating my house. And they sent me a message almost in tears because they're like, you have wrinkles. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, no, you don't understand, Joy. I There was a time in 2019 where um, my health was very bad. And it was assumed that I was not going to survive. And I, that I would just die young. And my friend was just in bits. Because they're like, you beat that. And you've grown up old enough mm. to have wrinkles. That is such a beautiful thing. Oh, see, that's and nice. That, that really, I was sitting there and I was like, yeah, that actually is. Um, I'm not going to use filters. I'm not going to hide my face. And the thing, the really funny thing is that I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which gives you a young face because of how your connective tissue works. Mm. So a lot of people, look, we look really young until we, we hit about like 50 or 60 and then we just like crumble to dust. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going, like people always say to me, like, you look younger than i think you are and i'm like thank you that's my genetic disability that makes my collagen do funny things but like when i do get people going you've got wrinkles when you smile you've got lines around your eyes and i can see why people online would just use filters to hide that because these people Mm. mean it critically and i'm like fuck that you know like wrinkles to me are a sign that i am still here i am a person like I, I don't understand why you don't want to have laugh lines because it means you've never laughed or it means you're yeah. frozen your face so that you never <laughs> have lights, you know? Yeah. And it's very surreal to me, but that I'm starting to engage with things like TikTok and Instagram that I'm getting comments from people going, Oh, I didn't realize you were that old. And I'm like, I'm not like I, and it, it can feel really defensive to be like, I'm not old. And it feels as if I'm having to defend myself as if I am actually this decrepit ancient thing. And I'm like, no, yeah. these people just don't understand what aging looks like. It was bad think- for me growing up because we had Photoshop, but now we have literal filters that, you know, you can put your hand over your face and, and then- it doesn't distort the filter. Yeah. That's harmful. That's bad. Yeah, there's like- one there's like one particular one that's kind of been brought in called Bold Glamour. It's like the main one on, I've seen tons of people on TikTok use it. And it does just give you, like, it completely changes your face. Like, actually, it like, it, it tailors your face. Um, like, it, it gives me a smaller nose. And I've got a pretty small nose as is. But, it, like, it makes that, that kind of, like, you know, the really stenciled, like, thin nose. 
that everyone is is kind of like the mainstream yeah like attractive it, it gives everyone that it gives everyone like super high kind of cheekbones it, remo- it, it removes any sort of character from your oh, face oh yeah and i it is you know it's that old adage everyone is sexy but no one's fuckable yeah like it's very much like everyone looks like a mannequin I don't want that. Like for, nah. I mean, I, I know everyone has their preferences and everything else, but I'm I'm sitting there going, if you don't want any uniqueness to the people that you like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Like that you don't see someone as they are and go, wow, their smile is wonderful, or wow, look at the, you know, I, one of the things I love about my husband is that when he smiles, his eyes vanish because he's just so happy. He has this <laughs> like perfect little like crease around his eyes and it makes me so in love with him every time I see it and I'm going I wouldn't have that in a you know with someone who d- who wanted to freeze their face mm. and I'm going that would be such a devastation to me I I could not it, it would be such a loss to not have that and I think of that with other people I'm going you're not getting to see the true person you're not getting to see their true expressions or their true emotiveness because it, it's just so I don't know. It's just really weird that everyone is so fixated on youth being the only way to be. Yeah. And it, you shouldn't. And the argument that Tiffany Reg had was, you need to follow older influencers. We need more older influencers so that you can see that actually you are normal. Yeah. I think- it's okay to age, and you don't have to age gracefully either. You can be a mad old lady with hundreds of cats if you want, and that's fine. That's what I'm yeah. doing. I'm fully <laughs> intending to go completely batshit. That that is my goal. I'm not going to age gracefully. And all it'll take is a couple more episodes of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I think like it's it's interesting like looking at kind of TikTok videos from a content creator perspective as like as as one. Like on Tumblr, it's really good fun. It's like you're shitting into the ether and people are like, <laughs> people are gobbling it up like little fish. Um, but like on, on TikTok, when I see people whose whole personas are a particular thing, like, like you know, there's, there is a guy out there whose entire bit is pretending to have conversations with a girlfriend that he definitely doesn't have and wears a, a fucking kitchen towel to pretend he's her and like i i don't know that to me is like i you know everyone's got their niche and stuff but like fucking hell i'd i'd be really (laughs) i'd be really upset with myself if that was like that was all i could offer on a tiktok side of things you know it's kind of like oh and i know that some content's just not for certain people yeah but I don't know, it's just... I was I was talking about this with some friends and actually showing how old I am in terms of like technology and stuff like the, the, the shift in technology mm. that's happened since I was a child. I was talking to my friend and he said to me, do you remember when the normies didn't have access to technology and the internet was just full <laughs> of freaks and geeks? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I'm not saying it was perfect. I'm just saying I didn't have to put up with the high school bully on Facebook pretending she's a nice person because they didn't know how to use the technology back then. It was the freaks and the geeks that knew how to use Mm -hmm. it. Um, And I think there's been, you know, like the, with the Twitterfication of everything, with Web 3.0, there's been this real shift towards streamlining and conformity. And it shows in the content that's being made. It shows in the, you know, the kind of like the stuff that trends they want you to, like with TikTok, you know, they don't let disabled people trend. They don't let fat people trend. Yeah. If they do, it's because it's a one-off. But they'll literally, if you if you show yourself, I mean, it happens to um, Crutches and Spice, who's a huge disability advocate. Um, her stuff only really goes viral when her fans push it or when she doesn't have her mobility aids in shop. Mm. Because the algorithm goes, no. We, it's, it actively suppresses certain people and it wants you to look at the beautiful people who can sell you things yeah and that that comes into as well i've noticed that um tiktok has two different types of ads they have mm-hmm. the very blatant this is an advert ad and then they do the product placement like person ad and i know like so as as a content creator myself and on twitch like obviously, as you said that. 
as a as a breeds in content creator on Twitch. Like as a like you know, I've I've obviously been sent like games and stuff, and technically me playing a game that I've been sent uh, on to to stream is is an advert. Um, and I put a link to the to the game in the uh, in the chat, and people can kind of go and do it. But see when. Like I, I tend to be quite upfront that something's an ad. I put hashtag ad in front of things. It's like you know, I need to kind of be the the legislation in the UK at least now is that if you are doing that kind of work, uh, you need to do it. And I'm not getting paid to play this game. I have just been sent the game, but that's still a like a free product you still have for to me to, it. Yeah. to to declare. But what I find is that like people are burying their declarations on. A TikTok in Link like, it bio. yeah, and it's like it's you know you see people who are advertising the most blatant shit, and you know we've talked about this before how you, like the influencers that do the the house packing stuff. Oh, mm-hmm. I got these bottles off of Amazon, and they buy a fucking different beige coloured vase every other week. You know, it's that kind of shit, and oh, check out the Amazon affiliate link and and all this kind of stuff, and it's. It's just... Ugh. And they don't even tell you it's affiliate. They just go link in bio as if yeah. they're doing your favour, bestie. But yeah. you, they, they are breaking UK, US, and I think certain parts of European legislation as well because you have to declare it when it's affiliate link. When yeah. I post any of my Hunger Pangs stuff, I have to declare that I use affiliate links because I, tr- I use Amazon, I use Apple, I use Barnes & Noble, I use a bunch of other affiliate links... Because I lose distri- distribution fees yeah. um, for being an author. And my ability to use the affiliate link gives me 10 cents back of the dollar that they take from me. And I'll take that 10 cents because it does add up if I get enough clicks eventually. Yeah. Um, uh, Fantasy Mind is asking, can we report those people? You can and you should. Yeah, yeah. I do. I'm petty enough that I go, oh, okay, <laughs> this person did not declare that this is an affiliate. I'm just going to hit. Especially if they annoy me, especially if it's like a beige mommy blogger thing that they're trying to be like, this is how I solve my child's autism by making everything beige. I'm like, I am going to report you for everything. <laughs> for everything. Um, <laughs> but um, it's just... All of the you crimes. Do have, yeah. You do have to be aware that when people are pushing things, like if they're not being upfront that something is an affiliate link, they're probably selling you something and they don't want you to know that they are selling you something. They want you to be thinking of them as a friend when actually they're being a brand ambassador and that's really insidious yeah. like i don't like amazon i'm very upfront that i don't like amazon but i will still tell you hey i use amazon links because i like making jeff bezos pay me money <laughs> it's, if i it's... have to use his shitty website because he has the monopoly on ebooks for a lot of places he's gonna have to pay me so that i can use those links but that's it yeah. Um, and I'm very upfront with that. I tell people right away, if you don't like this, this is an affiliate link. You can always do your own thing. But also, you can buy from these other links. Um, but you, a lot of these TikTokers just do not declare anything. Anything. Yeah. And it's bad. It's bad. It is. Right. Okay. I, I think that is us. Yeah. Um, Closing point, follow older people on social media so you don't get brain rot. <laughs> yes and you don't send people notes going you look so good for your age when they're 30 <laughs> <laughs> wise words <laughs> uh, cool right thank you very much for joining us for another episode of the Ice Sphere. if you're in Twitch chat don't go anywhere because we do hang around uh, after we've kind of closed up uh, this is so I can jump into the editing software and trim the video so it's uh, good to put up as a podcast uh, but that was episode 11 um, we will be back in two weeks time sorry it's been a wee bit um, inconsistent recently there's been issues the going world on. is on fire <laughs> <laughs> the world's on fire there's been personal issues going on so it's been a, a barrel of laughs um, but thank we'll be... you for sticking with us yeah thanks for thanks for putting up with us uh, and we will see you next time catch you in a bit folks bye bye